let's start there. So experiments. This is the, um, the third of those major research strategies I've been talking about. So alongside the survey and the case study is the experiment. It's a major way in which we collect data um, and, and, and organise our work. So it's an, an underpinning strategy of research, usually associated with um, quite a kind of quantitative approach as well, um, it doesn't have to be, and I'll, I hope I have one or two examples which are rather different from that, but it is associated with that. Um, whereas, you know, the previous week I talked about case studies, uh, that's very much associated with a qualitative approach. The opposite is true of experiments. Um, but, but not necessarily so. That, that's the important point to, to emphasise. A couple of the uh, issues about um, what, what is an experiment, what is, what is the nature of an experiment. <coughs> and I think one of the key points of the, the true experiment, and I'll, I'll say more about what a true experiment is as opposed to one isn't true in just a moment, but the true experiment is this assignment of subjects to different conditions. And in a true experiment, that's a random assignment. So the idea is that you manipulate things in the world, you assign people, you put them or give them or, or help them undertake some specific set of conditions which another group don't have or which another group has different versions of. Um, and there may be more than two groups. So you may have one group that gets one set of conditions, you do something to them, you may do something different to a second group, and then have another group which doesn't get anything at all. And that's often called the control group, the group that has nothing or, or that has the, the status quo in some sense. <clears throat> and you then manipulate um, uh, these, these variables. I mean, you can manipulate directly um, by, by saying those people of these characteristics get that, those people of these characteristics get this and so on. So, you know, so-and-sos get this treatment, so-and-sos get that treatment. Or it might be manipulated in some other way by making sure that there's a, a, you know, a, a range of different uh, variables in the different groups you're, you're working with. And then the important thing is you're interested in what all of this has, this manipulation and these other variables, the independent variables. You're interested in what effect that has on some other variable, some other condition that's being experienced. And that's called the dependent variable. In other words, it's dependent upon the independent variables and the, the, the manipulations you make. So the manipulations might be um, you're giving people different conditions. Let's go back to a very simple example from school, for example, where you might have um, uh, different teaching methods being compared. You might give one class one teaching method, another class another method, and the, the third class might get tra the traditional method that you've been using for years. So that's the, the manipulation you're doing. And then the independent variables might be things like the age of the class. We might say, actually, all of those students are going to be the same age. So we, we control that variable by making sure they're all the same age group. Because, of course, different ages may learn differently. So let's make sure of that. We make sure that there's a, a range of male and female uh, kids in, in the class and so on. So we, we, we control the independent variables because we think both age and gender might have some impact on the dependent variable. And what we might measure here is how well they learn. So whatever the teaching method is doing, it's, we're interested in, in some kind of measure or some kind of impact of that on how well the students are learning. So how well they're learning is the dependent variable. And very commonly, we'd measure that. We'd have some kind of test. In school, of course, that's very simple. You just give the <coughs> school kids a, a, a test or examination to measure their, their, um, <coughs> their success in learning. And uh, that, that's, so that's the manipulation, the different kinds of things that we do with the students. That's the independent variable, which is or the independent variables, which were the things that might, may affect how the outcome happens. And the final outcome, the dependent variable, which we're interested in, in, in measuring. And last point, or the next point, is control of the other variables. We assume, by the way that we've set the experiment up, the other variables are controlled. And what we mean by that is that we, as experimenter, have control over the effect of other things. Um, and we usually do that by excluding them in some way. Um, so we might say, in the case of, of school children, we <coughs> might think that um, maybe their, their social background, their social class, has some kind of impact on how well they're going to learn. So we control for that by making sure there's a mixture of all the various social classes in each of the classes we're looking at. 
to be controlled in that way. Or we might say we want to, we, we may think there's a difference between children who've been brought up in the French educational system and children who've been brought up in the English educational system. Well, in that case, we might control that by excluding all the French children. So we make sure that we've got no French children in the class because that's going to confuse things. So we control it in a direct fashion in that way. Whichever way we do it, we assume that all the other things that could make a difference <coughs> have been controlled. So that's the idea of the experiment, is that by some manipulation, it's usually by a thing called random assignment, which I'll mention in just a moment, we assume that everything else that could make a difference has been controlled for. And that's important, that, that's a crucial thing about the experiment, because we can then work backwards from that to say that the things that we're manipulating and the things that we're directly controlling, like the independent variables, are the things that have had a causal effect on the outcomes. And therefore, if the outcome changes, if the dependent variable is different across the different groups, we can deduce from that that the reason for it, or the cause of it, is because of either one of the independent variables, which in my, in my example is something like gender or, or, uh, uh, or the age of the child, or, more, more forcefully, the manipulated thing, which is the different techniques of teaching you're using, one of those things has caused the change in independent variables. And if, we, if yeah, our independent variables are, are uh, manipulated in the right kind of way, we can eliminate those, usually by some kind of statistical method. You can you just compare the boys with the boys and the girls with the girls and so on, for example. Um, and then you can see whether the manipulation, i.e. the different teaching method, has really caused a difference in what students learn. And that's the real power, um, and I said it in the last point here, in order to make causal judgments. The real power of the experiment is if it's done properly, if it's designed well, it's carried out properly, and it has these proper kind of a random assignments and, uh, to, to different conditions. If it has all of that, then we can be pretty certain that any, if we do find any differences in the dependent variables, the final outcome, then the cause must be our manipulations. And so we know that it's the different teaching methods that cause students to learn different amounts and to different degrees and so on. So that's the real strength of the experiment. Um, now, of course, it can be more complex. We might find that that method works for boys but not for girls, which is why you have these other variables in it, the other independent variables, like gender, so you can then say, well, actually, we've got a more complex situation. we found that the, the method works. There are differences for the boys, but not for the girls, because the method works for the boys, but, but not for the girls. And, and so complicated situations like that can be tested for as well by, by introducing these, these independent variables. The assumption is that everything else, because you've controlled for it, is irrelevant. So the fact that one class might be full of very bright children is controlled for you deal with that in some way. Normally what you do is eliminate that possibility by, by some kind of random assignment. So you make sure you don't have a class that's brighter than the other class to begin with and therefore they might learn better and so on. Um, and you do that by controlling. Okay, so that, that's the, the, what's called the classic experiment, the, the, the way it, it, it's laid out and, and some of these terms, the important things are the IV and the DV. Uh, I've put those terms on there because that's often shortened that way. The IV is short for independent variable and DV is short for a, for a dependent variable. And the idea of manipulation, the different groups that you give different manipulations to or do different things with, um, and then on the basis of that you can deduce... Uh, this causal judgment. So they're, they're the key points. Okay, well I've made something of this point of control already. Um, how do we control? And I've actually mentioned one particular solution, the direct control. Um, you have to con control the groups you're picking, the, the, the respondents you're using, um, because um, you want to eliminate all the other possible variables from, from the, the, the equation, so to speak. Um, and one way of doing that is, is this notion here, direct control, um, by simply choosing to exclude those who, who might confuse things in some way. So like I said in, in my example, if, if the age of children is, is a problem, uh, then you can simply restrict just simply to one age group. So the children are all of exactly the same kind of age group at the school, the same kind of year group perhaps. Um, and that way then you can, can make sure you've controlled 
for this particular variable, at least, that of age of, of the children. The, the, their age might make a difference in how well they're learning and so on. So you can do that. But of course, that's often very difficult to do. And actually, most of the time, we don't do that. It, it's quite difficult to control all the variables in this kind of direct fashion. Uh, and of course, age is only one of the things that might affect how people learn. It might be, like I said, social class, it might be their previous experience, it might be uh, their home life, it might be which school system they've been in before they came into this class, and so on, all kinds of things. And you can't control all of those in direct fashion. So what we normally do, and this is the, the, the normal form of the classic experiment, the, the true experiment, it's sometimes called as well, the true experiment, Control is done by randomization. Now, I mentioned this concept when I was talking uh, a couple of weeks ago about surveys. It's the same kind of principle as in surveys. We use some kind of random number technique rather than human choice to pick which subjects, which respondents go into to which group. Um, and as I said here, the true experiment, as defined by Ronald Fisher, just a couple of words about Ronald Fisher. He was a British statistician who worked, um, I think, between the wars, so in the 1930s, 1940s, he was working in this country. Um, and he's the man um, who developed a thing called analysis of variance, which you might have come across in your stats class. Uh, ANOVA analysis of variance is de uh, developed by, by Ronald Fisher. And he worked in an agricultural institute doing experiments. He designed the nature of an experiment. And I must admit, when I first started learning statistics years and years ago, I was always amazed that there were these things called split plot experiments. And I had difficulty understanding them anyway, but I thought, why are they called split plot? And it was only years later when I discovered that Ronald Fisher, who developed these ideas, worked in a, an agricultural research station. I suddenly realised what that meant. It really was literally plots of land. What he was doing was experimenting on different plants, putting them on different bits of land, different soils, different plots of soil, giving them different fertilisers, different treatments of different amounts of light and things like this. All those kind of variables that he was changing, all of those kind of things he was manipulating in these, the, these plants. And hence, you know, the nature of the experiment kind of follows on from that. So that's where it all comes from. Uh, we can blame this Ronald Fisher. Um, rather... Uh, a, a, a nice 1930s name, I think, Ronald. Not a name you come across very much these days. Anyway, so he was the, the, the man that, that defined the nature of, of the experiment. And, of course, the statistics we use to go with that, uh, things like uh, analysis of variance and t-test and so on, we use to um, analyse the results of, of experiments. So what, what did he, how did he describe this randomisation process? The randomisation is in two parts. Um, First of all, just as in surveys, we should pick participants randomly from a population. So just as you pick a survey sample in this random fashion, the same should be true of participants in an experiment. Although I have to say, actually, that's rarely carried out. Um, when you read the experiments um, you know, reported in the journals and so on, again and again, you find they've taken volunteers. Now, we know that's dangerous. Uh, volunteers are always slightly different from non-volunteers. Uh, but the assumption very often is that the things we're measuring uh, are not affected by their volunteering. Um, that's certainly true, I, I guess, in lots of psychological experiments where you're, you're measuring reaction times, things like this. Then there's no reason for thinking that volunteers are different from non-volunteers. But it is a problem that, that sometimes, and particularly in areas of social psychology, it's been criticised that many results are published based on the typical volunteers of, of the experiments are often American um, uh, university students who as part of their psychology degree have to volunteer to take part in their, their, their teachers experiments um, and uh, it's, a, it's a good way of learning what experiments are like of course but it does mean that the participants are a particular subgroup of American culture and society you know American uh, uh, psychology students are not typical of all Americans let alone all, all, all humans um, so we have to be a bit wary about particularly the, in the areas of social psychology where that might, might have an effect so, strictly speaking, it should be random selection from our population, just as in random sampling for surveys. And that gives you this generalizability, external validity, the idea that you can then generalize from your experimental results to the whole population that you, you've drawn the sample from. The second aspect of, and perhaps the one that really is crucial, the second aspect is this random allocation to different conditions. 
that basically if you've got two groups or three groups or whatever which are given different treatments, different conditions, group one, group two, group three, and group one and two might get conditions one and two, and group three might be the control group that gets you know, whatever was the status quo beforehand. Who goes in what group should be decided by some kind of random process as well. Random allocation to those groups. So not picking them, uh, but random allocation to them. And that's, that's what makes a, a true experiment, a, a classic true experiment, is that random allocation of those groups. So in a, a proper experiment, you will use some kind of random n- number technique to pick who's in what group. Now, that's quite restrictive sometimes. And I'll come back to this in just a moment, talking about how restrictive that is. And, but it does mean you get internal validity. The, the, the result of it is that you know that within the statistical bounds, of course all these things are statistical in the end, uh, within the bounds of statistics plus or minus a certain percentage, um, you know that whatever happens to the dependent variable was caused by the independent variables and the manipulation that you've chosen, particularly the manipulation you're interested in. So you can, you can deduce that causal uh, explanation uh, from your results because you've used randomization, and that gives you the real power to do this. Of course, there's still a possibility of bias. With any random allocation, there is. We might just be unlucky and get a very strange combination of people in our groups. Um, but that's statistically measurable, so we know it's plus or minus a certain percentage. Um, it, it, it falls within those bounds. It's always possible to, to get it and be unlucky, but we know that in the long run that won't happen, that on average we'll be within, within a, a, a reasonable area of certainty. Okay, so that's, that's the, 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 the classic experiment. Just to, to re-emphasise that, here's an example um, Another, I guess, another learning one, but this is people learning um, uh, with, with various kinds of noises going on in the background uh, to, to, um, to, to see if that affects how they are learning. So we, we have some, a kind of task, if you like, that people have to, to do to learn something. We can measure how well they, they're doing that. Um, and the question is, does noise make a difference? Does it help to have a bit of noise do you, does it help you learn better with a bit of noise or, or complete silence? Is that best? Or is a lot of noise uh, uh, good? And what I've done here is, is design it with three different conditions. The one condition, the control group, has no noise at all. So a very quiet situation. They're learning, they're trying to do this task of learning what it is they're going to be tested on, um, given a certain amount of time. Perhaps they're given 10 minutes to learn whatever it is they're trying to learn in a quiet situation. Second group, treatment group one, we called it, has a loud, unpredictable noise. So lots of noise, very loud, very jarring, and also unpredictable. So the, the, there's no kind of rhythm to it, and you know, it, it's coming soft and loud, but, you know, unpredictable intervals and so on. The kind of thing you might expect to be quite disturbing uh, with, with noise. So you know, sudden bumps and cracks and, and explosions, and then suddenly quiet again and so on. Very disturbing kind of noise. So we might think that, that that's going to be bad for learning. And then the treatment group two has some other kind of music. I, I know that there was some research on this some years ago that, that showed that apparently listening to Mozart helps you study something like this. So yeah, let's let's test that out. Let's have something like a you know a nice Mozart piano concerto, not too loud in the background while people are now. Is that better than complete silence? Possibly it is. So we'll see if that's the case. And is it better than this really now loud jangly noise? Probably is as well. So we might expect some results that show that the best learning comes from treatment two, the worst learning from treatment one, and in the middle is the control group that's neither too bad, you know, too much and too little. So that might be our, expression, our expectations of what happens. So that's how we design the experiment. So we now have to randomly assign people to the three groups. So we, we take... Again, we ought to be selecting from the population using some kind of random number technique, some kind of sam- random sample, so we get that. But we might just compromise a bit and take volunteers. But then the crucial point is that we allocate our group of respondents to those three conditions, the control, treatment one, treatment two, using random numbers. So we simply you know, go to our copy of Excel and generate some random numbers and, and then you know, number each person and then we... Uh, on the uh, basis of numbers, that determines which group they go into. Run the experiment, um, and you can see here that the task is, you know, a standard list of items to remember. So you might have a list of things, and they've got to look at it, and then 
you know, within a, a few minutes remember how many, what things are there, what order they came in, and so on and so forth. And then the test would be to reproduce that list in an accurate fashion. So I've already started this one. Uh, randomly allocate your, your participants to the three groups. They're all given the same task. Um, I've set it, memorised the list. And of course, each of them has different conditions. So typically, you might do one group after the other. Again, typically, experiments are done in a laboratory, in some kind of controlled condition. And again, this is uh, another consequence of that notion of control over the thing, that by having a laboratory, you can shut off the rest of the world. You can exclude all the other things that might make a difference. So you have a quiet closed room, no windows, you have artificial light and so on, you can control no noise from outside, etc. And then you can control the conditions in your particular treatment group. And it might be the quiet group that are just given quietness and, and given the task. Uh, or it might be the noisy group, which in case you have some loudspeakers, you know, making all that horrible loud noise and so on that's disturbing, we think it's going to disturb them, and so on. So the, the lab enables us to control those kind of conditions in that way. Um, so you do that, and you like the one group, you do the control group first, and you do the, the loud noise group, and then you do the, the Mozart uh, group third. Um, and it takes you a bit of time to do all that, but you wheel them in, wheel them out again, and, and do the, the, the test with them. It's also quite important they get the same, exactly the same conditions as well. So you give them exactly the same test. Uh, you read out the same instructions to them, and often in an experiment you have to go through that and make sure they get exactly the same instructions and then you give them the same test at the end to see how well they've done in, in the memory. And, of course, you give them the same time to do it and so on. So exactly the same conditions in terms of, of everything else. And then when you've done that, you compare the mean scores for each of the groups, and you can see whether they've done better or worse than each other. And with a bit of statistics, a bit of analysis of variance in this case, you better determine whether that difference is likely to be because of the manipulations you've made, the noise changes, or whether it's not likely uh, to be the case. Um, and as I know, it will be used to see if that's a significant difference or not. If you're lucky, uh, and if you've done it well, then you might find a significant difference, and then you can go out and publish the results and be joyful and have a good night celebrating that you found something and so on. But I'm afraid all too often we find it's not significant and, and we have to kind of have another go with something else, perhaps make the noise even louder this time to, to see if that makes a big difference. OK, so that, that's the classic experiment and how you would do that. And if any of you have done any study of psychology and, and things like this, a bit of biology perhaps, then you'll come across experiments in this kind of way, the classic experiment done in this kind of fashion. What's different between this and, and natural sciences is, of course, the randomisation aspect. I mean, we're dealing with people, and we know people vary and change and so on, so we have to make sure that we control those things through randomisation. In a, a physical experiment, uh, you, you wouldn't, you'd just assume that your lump of iron is always going to be a lump of iron and it hasn't changed and that's it, and you can work on it. Otherwise, the experiment is the same design. Now, I said that, that, that most experiments are done in the lab because it gives you that ability to control things. Um, you know, in some kind of, it doesn't actually have to be a, a what's labelled a lab, it could just be a room, but you, you make sure that's controlled. You make sure that the the environment and the conditions are controlled in that space. So I'm using lab in a quite a general sense of, of, of a, a place where you can control what's going on. But there are, there are downsides to that. And of course, the fact is that being in a lab might mean we act differently. You know, going into a room with another, a group often of strangers to do something in a place that has no light, no natural light, no window, you know, with all sorts of other strange things going on in place you've never been before, means you might act differently. So there have been some attempts to try to, to move the experiment out into the field. And as I said the other, the other week, that means out into a natural setting where people are more used to being and doing things there. So rather than doing your experiment on learning in a laboratory, you might do it in a place where people normally learn, in a school, for example, um, because that's the natural place where do, people do things. So there's been a move to try to do that, but there are severe problems with this. And one of those things is that random allocation may be difficult. And when you think about schools, you can see how that comes about. What you'd like to have in a school is one class that consists of children randomly allocated to that class who get one particular treatment, another class 
randomly allocated to that class who get a different treatment, another group that get control, and so on and so forth. That's something you can't do in schools. You cannot just simply randomly allocate children. Children get very upset if you do that to them, and not surprisingly. Children are allocated to classes already for all sorts of other reasons. It might be some kind of, of uh, streaming system. It might be some kind of, of um, allocation based on their surnames and so on. Whatever system's been used in school, they get used to that and they don't want to change it and they don't like it being changed. So ethically, uh, and, and to some extent practically, it's almost impossible to randomly allocate in that kind of situation. And that's true of many other field settings as well. It, it's not possible to simply ask people to do different things um, I mean, the, the, the nice example I like here is if you're trying to do an experiment on countries. Um, I always I often wonder whether dictatorship's good for a country or not. OK, let's randomly allocate. That country can have a dictatorship, that country can have a democracy. And you randomly allocate. And you can't do that. That's, that's impossible. That's not on, um, practically, let alone ethically. So that kind of random allocation, and that, of course, is the heart of an experiment, is very difficult to do. And so you can't do true experiments in the field. Uh, very often for that reason. And of course it goes with the point too, the ethics of control. The ethics of doing things to people might be an issue as well. Not just randomly allocating to groups, but actually then doing something to them in some way that might affect them. Now, okay, let, let's just think of an example here. Say you're doing some experiment on, on a work situation and you want to know, does, does a, you know, back to my loud noise, does a loud noise make people more, more prone to accidents? OK, let's do an experiment in the field on that. Let's have some people at work working away with their, um, I don't know, let's say it's someone who's um, using um, you know, chisels and hammers and so on to, to chisel away at wood. Uh, let's play a loud noise and see if they have more accidents, see if they cut their hand off more frequently or not. Well, of course, you can't do that. That's not ethical to do that. You just cannot do field experiment. You'd like to be able to do that because it's in the field, but you can't do it. There may be problems for validity as well, and this is going to be because the field means that we can't control everything. We all, sometimes we're not quite sure why something has happened. We find a difference. We think it's due to our experimental variation uh, and manipulation, but actually we can't tell for sure. There might be something else that's happened in the world that's caused our effect to happen. So we, the validity is whether it, we're, what, what we're measuring really is what's happened, and we may be unsure about that for all sorts of reasons. And overall, just to summarise that point, there's a likely lack of control. You cannot control for everything. In the field, you can try to control for some things, but it's very difficult to control for everything that's going on, all the various differences between people and so on that might happen. So field experiments are, are quite difficult to do. Very good in the sense that they are realistic, and if you can do them, it's a good idea to do them, but you have to be aware of all these kind of problems that under, undermine the the validity and, and the, the robustness of what you're doing. Okay, to summarise those points then, the, the, the advantage of the, the, the field experiment is the better generalizability. It is in the field, it's in the situation people are used to. You're doing it in the office, in the school, you know, in the playground, you're doing it in the, you know, on the public transport system, whatever it is that, that the field you're looking at. So you know that you can generalise from that to other situations of that kind. You know, other schools and other offices and so on will be similar in that way. We can do that. And it be, we have to be careful about this. It's not statistical generalisation. It is what's often called ecological validity. It's, it's the, the kind of the more natural setting uh, um, that, that gives us that ability to generalise out from that. Um, and, and, of course, that's a big advantage sometimes, that we know that these things are not just happening in the lab, they're happening in the real world. We can improve validity as well. Um, we, we, I mean, I said before that sometimes that's, that's difficult to know because other things might, might intrude. But, of course, by being in the field, we know that what we're measuring is what happens to people really in the real things they're doing. In that sense, it's, it's a more valid way of looking at things um, than the lab would be, because the lab is a false situation, a false set of conditions, if you like, for people. Um, so it might improve a little, at least in that respect. Although, as I said just now, there's always the danger that other things might be intruding and might be, might be causing the dependent variable changes. And, of course, a not, no, and by no means a, 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 an insubstantial point is that the, the improved... Um, 
availability of participants by going out in the field you're doing things with people in the real world and they're there already so they're more likely to volunteer or be available to you and so on rather than having to take time out from their normal work to come to your lab to travel spend time with you and so on which is a, a dissentive really okay so there are difficulties so to summarize that they're, they're not often done because we know all these other problems of, of control and manipulation setting things up and so on and, and, and the like even though there are advantages that field experiments are difficult to do. And, and difficult to do and still keep as a true experiment um, as well.